Good morning, Brazos Fellowship. Thank you guys so much for joining us this morning, being a part of this live streaming service. And I want to say right here at the top of my time with you, happy Father's Day to all the dads out there. Thank you for the hard work you put in every week, blood, sweat, and tears for your family. And, and if you haven't yet today, take some time today to show your dad some love. Give him a call if he's out of town or if he's busy, etc. But make a point to tell him thank you. And I just encourage you to reflect on just the years of hard work that many of our dads put in that we never really thanked or never really realized. I mean, decades that they gave to our well-being and to the life that we enjoy every day. And so let's take a moment to thank them, show them some love today. So thank you, dads. We love you. Uh, today we're going to continue a series entitled Simplified that we've been in for a, a number of weeks now. And in this series, we've literally been just looking at this secret that Jesus is revealing. He's revealing a secret to us. It's really, and it comes in the form of an invitation, a secret on how to live a life that has less stress, less anxiety, less peace, uh, pardon me, more peace, <laughs> more peace, more focus, and more love. Love for other people, love for God. It, it brings up our capacity and quotient for love exponentially. It's literally just learning to live the way that Jesus lived. Follow his practices. Follow his disciplines. And his invitation comes to us this way in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Here's what he says. I tell you what, let me, let me read it to you because it may not be there. Okay. Matthew 28, uh, uh, Matthew 11, verse 28. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. Weary and burdened. And I will give you rest, he says. Has there ever been a time where we are more weary and burdened than today with all that is going on in our world? He says, take my yoke upon you. As we talked about several weeks ago, yoke was a piece of farming equipment that helped you to bear up under a load. He's showing us how to bear up under the load of life. He's not trying to convince us that life is super easy and there's no challenges. That would be a lie. He's just saying, look, yeah, life has a load to it. Let me show you how to carry life with ease. Let me show you how to take on my yoke. And this yoke was literally a metaphor that was used by rabbis that taught in Jesus' day that was like his way of showing us how to be the people of God, how to follow in the footsteps of the Son of God. And he's showing us here to take my yoke upon you and learn from me. In other words, to become my disciple, my follower, my apprentice. We've been using this word. And to be an apprentice of Jesus, it means to follow not only his teaching, but his example. And in doing this, today we're going to look at some of the most difficult, most challenging teaching of Jesus. As a matter of fact, some of the teaching that Jesus gives I would say that most people either don't agree with it or just, out, just outright say, I, uh, I don't like it, <laughs> all right? Because it runs diametrically opposed to the American way of life. Let me show you what I'm talking about here. Let's take a look at Matthew chapter 6, starting with verse 25. He says, don't worry about your life, what you will eat and drink, and about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? And then he jumps down, we're going to jump down to verse 33. He says, and seek first his, his being God, seek first God's kingdom. Now you may look at that and say, well, Will, or maybe if you were a contemporary with Jesus during his day, you'd say, Jesus, that's exactly what I worry about. Oh my gosh, especially during a pandemic, I'm worried about my life. I'm worried about my kid's life. I'm worried about my family's life. I'm worried about everybody's life right now. And also, when it comes to stuff and things and money, and I worry about having enough. I worry about being able to pay the bills. I worry about paying the, uh, our loans off and making everything right and, and Jesus isn't saying those things aren't a part of your responsibility. Yes, work hard, take care of them. He's just saying, I want you to come to a place where you're not chronically worried, stressed, anxiety-stricken over these things. That almost seems un-American. That almost seems like, that is that even possible? And then in Mark chapter 4, verse 19, here's what Jesus says. He says, the worries of this life, 
The deceitfulness of wealth and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Wait a minute, Jesus. You're saying that wealth has a component to it or a tendency to it that it deceives us, it leads us astray, it, it, it causes us to believe things that are not true at times? Yes, exactly. And he goes on to say, and you're saying that wealth also can choke out, suffocate out the life spiritually, out of our spiritual heart, out of our life, the kingdom purposes that God has for our life, it could literally rob those away from us, taking the power of God's word away in terms of its application in our life? Yes, exactly. This is challenging. And if you read these kind of passages, and this is just two of many in the New Testament that talk about these kinds of things. If you come away from these passages saying, that's confusing at best, a little crazy at worst, I'm not sure even what to do with that. If you feel that way, you're not alone. A lot of people feel that way. And it, it, it is one of those things that, that causes us to question, like, what is it we're missing here? What is it that Jesus is trying to include? What is he trying to lead us into? What is it that he's asking us to adopt? And even I, I'm going to share a little more later, but I have really struggled. This was some of the passages in the New Testament where early on in my walk with Jesus, it was really a challenge and difficult for me to accept and here's part of the reason why that is true for all of us. Most people don't actually believe the gospel of the kingdom. This is what I mean by that. Meaning, the life you've always wanted, the life I've always wanted, the life you've always wanted, we've all always wanted, is available to you right where you are through Jesus. Like, it's available right now, right here. You don't have to wait until you make a certain amount of money. You don't have to wait till you get past this relationship status, go from single to couple or from couple to having a child. You don't have to wait. You don't have to wait until you're healthier. Like if I just got healthier, then, then I would start to experience the true kingdom like, that God wants me to have. Or you don't have to wait until your age changes if you get a little bit older. No, it's available to you right here, right now. But this is a very hard thing for most people to accept. Even people who say, I've been following Jesus for years, and I struggle with that sometimes. To really believe that right where I am right now, that I can experience God as much as I can at any other time if I would turn to him right now. And here's part of the reason why that is true for us. Our culture has sold us a different gospel. In other words, gospel is just a word that means good news. There is another good life that our country, our culture has sold us that is diametrically opposed to what Jesus taught. For lack of a better term, I want to call it the gospel of wealth. The gospel of wealth. Jesus says that wealth is deceitful. That it will deceive us. It will lie to us. It will mislead us, right? And so there is this gospel of wealth that promises something really wonderful, and it sounds so good, and people hook, line, and sinker believe it. And here's the gospel of wealth. It simply says, the more you have, the happier you will be. The more you have, the more money you have, well, we really believe that. Even though people would say, well, well, I'm not sure that all like, money can actually equate into happiness, but we live like that's the truth. And we envy people who have more than us. And we envy people who are the latest and greatest. We envy people who have the new house, the new car, the new whatever. We look at that and we say, if I could just have, oh man, it's like a little slice of heaven. It's like I get to go to heaven now while I'm still on earth. If I could do that, then man, I definitely would be happier. It is a belief that we've bought into. But I want to tell you today that that belief comes with a price. There's a reason why the only other God Jesus ever calls by name is Mammon, the God of money. He says, I want you to be so aware of this and careful with this. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, he says, you cannot serve both God and mammon, which we translate money, things, stuff. 
You can't. You, you, you can't do it. Not possible. Now, it's interesting here because we, uh, we live in a day when we are bombarded with messages all the time, constantly, in our culture. And in these messages that we have, um, oh, well, before I jump into that, let me just say this, that uh, sociologists, kind of in response to this right here, sociologists tell us that re the most latest research tells us that the number one leisure activity of Americans today is shopping. Shopping. They said that it has actually replaced religion as the used to be the number one leisure activity of America. And the research goes on to say that really the, the greatest competitor for American Christianity is not atheism, it's shopping. It's literally just us always incessantly online or wherever we're shopping, we're looking, what's the latest and greatest, what's the next thing, where's the next vacation, where's the next, we're always shopping, shopping, shopping. And it's this um, insatiable appetite. And that appetite is one that can get us into trouble. And so I, I just wanna challenge us today to really think through how that is impacting our life today. And what makes this such an incredible internal battle for us is that we don't know when to shut it off. Let me just say this, and I'm just as a kind of a, a reminder to you. One of the things that makes this so difficult is that you, your family, your kids, all day, every day, you are bombarded with roughly 4,000 advertisements every single day. Now, give or take, I don't know, maybe a few hundred or a few thousand, depending on how much TV you watch and how much online time and social media that you're, but we all, we are bombarded with advertisements. So with that said, let me just do a little refresher course about advertising that you already know. You already know this stuff I'm about to tell you, but it's just important to be reminded of it. Here's the first thing I wanna tell you. Advertising is propaganda. In other words, Advertising is a multi-billion dollar industry designed around one thing, to lie to you and me, to get us to believe if we will buy some goods or services that our life will be happy, or at least a little happier if we will buy these things, if we will buy into that, that process. Um, and they intentionally, they intentionally seek out are intentionally designed to make us think that our wants are our needs. And it's crazy because there used to be a time here in America when our, our purchases really just revolved around our needs. What, whether we needed it or not, how long would it last? The advertisements were really were just trying to help us to see this is a good, solid product that will last for a long, this may be the last one you ever buy. But today, we're being convinced by a system, multi-billion dollar system, that what you want is actually something you need. And, and we even justify, say, well, I've been wanting it for so long, and it's on sale. Look, it, it's available, right? And it's 30% off. It's 50% off. It's 10% off. It's no percent off. But I want it so bad, and I've got the money. Let me get it right now. And we justify it like that. And we wind up looking at these things like, if I could just get this, then I will be happier. And it leads us down a trail of self-deception and depression. And it's really interesting. The irony of this is that sociologists and psychologists tell us that we are we have, in this country, in our Western culture today, 10 times more people who are struggling with depression without any actual cause or without a identifiable cause than we did 50 years ago. 10 times the number of people that are struggling with depression in our country today. We have more of everything, folks. We have more of everything except happiness. My question for you today, or I just thought to get you to ponder, is maybe Jesus was right. Maybe what he was teaching is something we need to take a step back and say, all right, Jesus, let me take a look at this. Let me really reflect on what you said here. Let me really let my heart 
marinate in this for just a moment and really look at what you're saying about my situation. And maybe this is true of you right now, right where your family is and your purchasing practices. It would be really easy for us to say, okay, well, then what we're gonna do is we're getting rid of everything, we're gonna live off the grid, but that wouldn't fix it. You know that already. Because getting rid of all your stuff, you see, the problem isn't stuff. The problem isn't stuff. The problem is, and let me give you two uh, statements that I think will really help maybe to hone down on the issue. The, 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 the first issue is that we put no limit on the stuff because of our insatiable appetite for more. More and more and more. You know what I'm talking about. The moment that we get something, it takes about you know, 48 hours to a week or a month or something and the new wears off and we're already starting to think about what is that next thing I want to get? What's the next thing? What's the next thing? It's an insatiable appetite for more. We talked about this the last couple of weeks that desire has, it is infinite. We are finite. It leads to restlessness in our hearts and here's the second thing it does. We're convinced we need all sorts of things to be happy. We may never say that out loud, but deep down, we find ourselves thinking, hmm, if I just had that boat, if I just had that vacation spot, if I just had that, if I had that new vehicle, if I just had that, and nothing wrong with these things, nice things, that's, it's a blessing. It is wrong when our heart begins to get fixed on those things as a part of our happiness and satisfaction and what life is actually all about. Jesus challenges that over and over and he's saying, I want you to take a step back. And I'm going to make some statements. They were radical in his day. They're maybe even more radical today. And here's one of them. From Acts chapter 20, verse 35, is a quote from Jesus where he taught, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Wait, Jesus, you're saying, if I want to raise the blessing quotient of my life, I want to be more blessed by God. I need to learn how to be more generous? Exactly. Not have more things. Like, you're gonna have to, there's times you have to buy things, you have to provide for your family, you have to, you gotta take care of needs and you gotta take care of stuff, but don't ever look to those things to be the satisfying of the soul, the thing that actually blesses your life because they won't, you cannot derive blessing from earthly things. It only comes from the things of Jesus. It, it comes directly from being more generous. And in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, as I read just earlier, you cannot serve both God and money. Now notice, these are really interesting statements. Jesus is not commanding here. He didn't command in the other one. It's more blessed to give than to receive. That's not a commandment. It's just a truth statement. It's just an observation about the human condition. He's just saying, this is the way I designed you. This is the way you've been made. This is the way you were wired. And if you tap into this and begin to live out of this, it will radically change your life. It will radically change the weight of life. There is an enjoyment, there is a joy factor, there is a lightness that comes to life when you learn to be generous. Not just with money and possessions, but with time and energy and focus and gifts and talents and all the things that God has given you. Here once again, not a command. He says you cannot serve both God and money. He's not saying you shouldn't. He's just saying you can't. Like it's not possible. I mean, you could try, but you won't be successful. You will wind up doing one or the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And in Luke chapter 12, here's what Jesus says. I love this. He says, life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Like true, deep down, joyful, like the life our soul longs for. He's saying, look, I just want to save you some time. You're not going to find that kind of abundance, that kind of abundant life will not be found in your house, in your closet, in your garage, in your investment portfolio. Not going to be found there. It will not be found there. That you're going to have to look outside. It, it, the things that deep down your soul longs for, it's going to be found in seeking me and putting me first and letting me show you how to truly love other people selflessly the way Jesus loved. 
And I, I, it's such a beautiful observation. It's beautiful. I, I, I think about this and it reminds me of my own kind of pilgrimage, my own struggle, my own growth spiritually, where I went through a time, if I could be really honest, early on, where um, as, a, as a young Christian, I would read these passages about stuff and money and wealth and just think, oh my gosh, it made me cringe a little bit. I didn't know what to do with them. I knew that what Jesus was saying was true. I just didn't wholeheartedly believe that it actually is the best way to live. I would look at those passages and say, okay, I'm gonna go put those in the category over there with like fasting and celibacy. <laughs> I don't really wanna do those things, man. Lord, you could have those back. I don't really want. So I, I found myself doing that a lot. But what was amazing to me, I remember early on when I began to start to apply this and began to say, okay, God, I do want to put you first. I want to learn how to be more generous. I want to start intentionally serving you over the things and the money in my life. I want to begin to find my greatest love and passion, not in possessions, but in you and in the people that you bring into my life that I can serve, that I can love. It was amazing when I started to put this stuff into practice. You know what was incredible to me? It was like, it hit me like a ton of bricks. It was like, dang, Jesus was right. It's true. It actually works. It is actually a more freer and actually a more, um, a, a, a more um, kind of powerful way to live. It's incredible. In other words, more stuff doesn't equal more happiness, but more stress. That's what I found out. It, it, it equals more stress. It equals less time. It equals less money. More stuff equals more time to have to fix and to maintain and to clean and to keep up with and to update a bunch of junk that I didn't really need in the first place. I really, after I had it, I realized I didn't really need this. I thought I did at the time. I was really convinced of it, but now that I've got it, I didn't really need it. And here was a great question that I kind of came to. What if more stuff actually equals less of what matters most? What if having more stuff means I have less time, that I have less financial freedom, that I have less opportunity to be generous, that I have less peace, less focus, less love, less relational capacity, less ability to really pour into other people, less margin in my life, less prayer and time with God. It just like hit me like a ton of bricks. Like I have got to change my habits with my, my relationship with my money and my things because this is not serving me well. Jesus was right. And let me give you three kind of action steps so you can begin to implement this in your life. And, and next week, I want to give you even more practical steps that I think can help in putting this into daily and weekly practice with you and your family. You can begin to do this with a friend or with a spouse or whoever. Begin to put these things into practice. Here's the first one. Become more generous. Really take to heart Jesus' challenge. It is more blessed to give than to receive. To look for practical ways throughout the day. Starting today, where you give somebody just five, 10 minutes of your day. You, you serve them. You go out of your way. You take a moment to encourage somebody. Maybe it's just through a text or an email or something. But you look for ways that you can be generous. You buy. Maybe you, you invest. You help somebody else. It could be totally anonymous. So fun. You could just be a secret Santa in the middle of June. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be cool? You could just bless somebody just for the fun of it. But we can't do that if we're consuming all of it ourselves. It's amazing when we learn to become generous. Here's the next one. Intentionally choose to serve God over money. And here's what I mean by that. Before we dive into a purchase, we ask God about it. Before we dive into a, our next purchase, especially the bigger the purchase, the more time you need to give yourself time to just talk to God and ask the Lord, God, is this something I really need right now? Is this something I need to purchase right now? Or maybe I need to hold off just a little bit and, and really consider 
maybe God has something else he wants you to do with the resources you might have been pouring into this. He had something altogether more exciting and wonderful and incredible that could impact other people. But he can't do it if you've tied up all the resources and whatever that was going to be. And here's the third one. Stop searching for the abundant life in possessions. Stop searching for the abundant life in possessions. In other words, really think about the cost of things before you invest in them. So important, guys. Not just the financial cost. There is a time cost. There is an energy cost. There is a focus, mental energy cost. Is this thing a life-giving thing I'm about to buy? Or is it a life-sucking thing? Is it really going to take away from you? Is it, is it a net gain or a net loss? Let's be honest. Because a lot of us, I, me, I will absolutely confess this right. I bought a lot of boneheaded things that were a life suck, right? They sucked the life out of me. They sucked the money out of me, time. I didn't have it to give, but I did it, and I regretted it later. Don't live like that. Jesus is saying, you don't have to live like that. You know what? You have a choice. You can, you can decide today, I'm done doing that. I'm not doing that anymore. I'm gonna ask better questions before I go dump my resources into anything. I'm gonna be smarter. And that is what this question does. This is, that's what this statement does. It gets us to begin to think about it. And today, I mean, you and I could walk away from this and say, I reject all that, I'm not gonna do any of that. But just know that when you do that, it is a step away from God and his design and his plan and his will for your life. Don't do that. It will hurt you. It will wind up causing you to live a life that goes against the grain of the very universe that God has created. Goes against the grain of the very soul that he put inside of you. He created us to live in this rhythm. He created us to live with this kind of open-handed, open-heartedness to be able to learn to live this kind of abundant life, but it does not come from this kind of American-born wealth gospel that says, if you just have a little more, you'll be a little more happy. Man, have we bought that. And I just want to encourage you today to take a step back and say, I don't want to live in that system anymore. I'd like to be free of that, Jesus. Thank you. I'd like to just follow where you went, and I'd like to let my life reflect your values, Jesus. I want to take on that easy yoke. I want to follow your lead. Here's the application prayer. I'm asking you to pray with me today. It's simply saying, Jesus, I commit to simplify my view of money and possessions by learning to live with less. I choose to serve you over money and possessions. And maybe today, you're making that commitment and, and it's not even just that you feel like you're just like a completely out of control, materialistic maniac. Like that's not what I'm talking, I mean, maybe where you are, but most people are not. It's just simply saying it's become a little too important. I find myself, when I do have leisure, spare time, yes, Will, I, I shop probably more than I should. I, it consumes a lot of my time, a lot of my thought, a lot of my mental energy goes to stuff that is not life-giving. If we could be brutally honest with one another, Jesus is saying, and that's, there's a reason for that. You weren't designed to live that way and to live abundantly. It, it robs abundance. It doesn't give it. And so today, I just want to encourage you, would you be willing to just take some just heavy self-evaluation before God and say, God, show me where I'm doing this. Show me where I am making stuff, money, things, just the materialistic part of life too important. Like, I think about it too much. I, I put my hopes and desires on it too much. I pin too much on that, Lord. And it's time for me to begin to shift focus and put it back on you. And, and right now, I just want to encourage you, if you would be willing to make that commitment. And for those of you who maybe would say, I've never stepped over the line of faith and said, I commit to you, Jesus. I trust you. I love you. I want a relationship with you. And maybe you've never come to that place before. This is a brand new, uncharted territory for you. And you're saying, yes, I want to say yes to Jesus today. I want to begin that relationship. And I have been far from God. I've been running from God, if I can be honest. Maybe that's where you are today. And it's time for you to step over that line of faith and say, Jesus, I ask you to forgive my sin and be the Lord of my life. Every part of it, this part included, money and things. 
I ask that you would lead my life. And if you're a daddy here today, you're a dad and you're, you've never made this commitment, it's the greatest commitment you could make as a father to connect with your heavenly father, to let him show you what unconditional, beautiful fatherly love could be like. It will fill you up with supernatural ability to love your children, grandchildren, nieces and nephews, your spouse in ways that you've never been able to before, incapable of it without the help of God's spirit in our life. So right now, I'd like to invite you, if you would, open up your heart to God. Let him speak to you today, wherever you are. Let him, take that, let, let him encourage you to take that next step, wherever that edge of faith is, would you be willing to step over that edge and trust God with that next step? Just, maybe it's just him saying it's time for you to become more generous, to be, look for more opportunities that I put around you for you to give of your time, your energy, your, your money, your things. Share. There is such blessing in that, such joy that comes from opening our hands up. And maybe it's just learning how to pray before we make a purchase. We, we put our, uh, our, our, our heart's allegiance on God rather than money and things for our life and for our future. So right now, I'd like to invite you, would you bow with me in prayer? God, we come before you right now. We thank you so much for your love for us. We thank you, God, that you give us such beautiful insight into how to live a life of this easy yoke, a life that is free of weariness and burdens and money and things and possessions and accumulating wealth and investing it can cause us, let's be honest, so much weariness and burdensome in our life. And I pray, God, that today we would lay all that down before you and say, Lord, it's yours. I trust you. Right now, right here, I put you before all those things. I'm gonna begin to make prayer a first step before any major purchase. I'm gonna put you, God, as a part of my decision-making process from here forward to really ask the tough questions. What is the greater price I'm going to have to pay here? Not just the financial price for the item, but all on the other levels of time and emotion and energy and spirituality. And there's so many other things that have to be considered. God, help us to be smart about this. I pray we commit to that right now just to say, Lord, help us to be wiser in the way that we make our purchases, the way that we look at wealth and possessions. And right now, Lord, I pray for any person who's hearing my voice that's saying, you know what? God is nudging my heart today that I need to begin a relationship with God right here, right now. And if that's you, would you just pray right where you sit? Would you say, God, I want a relationship with you. Scripture tells us that that relationship comes through his son, Jesus Christ, who loved you so much. He came to this earth, lived a sinless life, died on a Roman cross, was put in a tomb, resurrected from the dead in order to pay the penalty for your sin, for mine and for every person. If we will receive him, trust him, then we get to lay hold of that promise. We get to have that beautiful gift of salvation and forgiveness becomes our own, becomes ours forever. Would you pray to receive that right now? Say, Jesus, I'm asking to receive your forgiveness right here, right now. I'm asking you to take over leadership of my life in every area, including my things, my possessions, and my finances. I want to follow you. I want to know what it's like to be loved by you every day and to walk in your spirit to walk in your wisdom if you just ask Jesus Christ to forgive your sin and to be the Lord of your life for the very first time would you just lift your hand right now I want to pray for you God I pray for every person who's given their heart to you right now today I ask God that you would change their heart change them from the inside out you you promise in your word that we are new creations the moment that we make that commitment I ask God that this would be a transformative moment for so many who hear this message today. Thank you, God, for changing us forever. If you would, indicate your decision to us online so we know how to pray for you and encourage you in that decision. 
We pray it all in the incredible name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you guys. Guys, have a wonderful Father's Day, and we will see you back here next Sunday as we finish out our series, Simplify. God bless you. We love you.